and we're live. Oh, <laughs> we got there. Oh, eventually. Hmm. Eventually. eventually. Yeah. Slowly but surely. Yeah. So I'm just going to, I'm just going to talk because, because the plan, and I want to give myself a pause. The plan here is simply me talking with you about this, right? <laughs> and as I get everything out, once I get everything out, taking the transcript and then making it bullet points, because this is a very, this is such this has such a big fear around it, mm -hmm. right? And I still can't get over how great your makeup and hat and you're just, your whole vibe looks. <laughs> this oh. is the hat. This, this is the is pink, the pink hat. Hat. Of the, uh, This is the pink hat of the pink hat project. Oh, love that. Um. It's it's it. There's a lot of fear behind it because it's such a big thing to me, and it's. <laughs> you okay? <laughs> yeah, I just got a very awkward setup at this point. <laughs> I'm sorry. I know this is very awkward. No, it's, I was trying no, it's to get some that... height on the phone, and now it's not. Doesn't want to stay like together. What it was is that I started talking, and all of a sudden you were like, "Wow, what, <laughs> what?" I'm like. We should have had a V8. Right. Am I tripping right now? There we go. All right. Sorry. No, that's okay. I'm, I'm just... It's such a big thing to me, and I don't know if it's a big thing to me because it is only a big thing to me or because this is big, right? And I'm also kind of like, am I, am I crazy for doing this? Yeah, but do I truly believe that this is the case? Yeah. And was I told to tell this? Yeah. So, let me adjust my nose ring, too, because that's getting on my goddamn nerves. Okay. Mm. I keep on forgetting the resolution is so good, you can tell I didn't shave. Yeah. Whoops. They see my Whoopsie. beard before, so yeah. So I'm not really worried about that. But, um, there we go. So what do you think? I I don't know where to start. So I just start. Well, by saying I'm a I'm a getting this coming. I'm a getting this year. <laughs> well, the thing is that I don't know. Let's start at the know. beginning. Let's start it. Where is the beginning? The beginning of time? Sure. We could talk about that. Let's in talk about beginning. how punishments. In, yes. No, it's literally that. I am talking how, about. How does it go? How does it go in Good Omens? Or maybe, maybe you as Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy is in the beginning, there was a big bang, and scientists have uh, generally thought this to be a terrible idea or something like that. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, I can do that. <laughs> <laughs> See, well, now I'm going to want to look up the quote. Um, now yes. I'm going to want to look up the quote. <laughs> Go look up the quote while I talk. Okay, so. <laughs> what's happening here is that. In the beginning. In the beginning. It's what? really the only way to start anything, right? <laughs> Any sort of saga or epic something or other it's either right. in the beginning or it's once upon a time i mean these are it's the it's darkest a trope story for a night yeah right <laughs> it was a... it's a cliche for a reason okay so i guess the first thing i want the first principle is that punishments in their um punishments always end and in the Bible, time and time again, when there is a punishment, there is a time when it is over. Right? Mm -hmm. 
And the punishment we're referring to is the one um, associated with the fall of man, where Adam was, because of his greed and his lack of, t of taking personal responsibility, and um, was cursed to toil the land to forever work, work, work. Not forever. I just said it, was, it wasn't permanent. But to work, work, work. And never be satisfied with what he has. All right. And Eve was cursed with um, the one thing that would give her bearing and standing in society, her having children, would become difficult. Also, that while while she would be satisfied in her work, the center of her life will revolve around a man. You crave your husband and he will dominate you, right? Those two things have been lifted. Honestly, if I'm honest, they've been lifted since the, they've been they've been lifted since the First World War. And what I mean is around the time of the First World War, that's when things started to shake and people started to become more globally connected. That was the beginning of that. Well, and if you think about it, that was a time where women took over predominantly men's jobs, right? And the physical yeah. labor sector, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, and because they started... there was nobody there to keep the wheels of commerce turning. Right. They started to decenter from men. Because there was literally no choice. Correct. And then everybody comes back, not entirely in one piece, and all of a sudden it would be we're just expected just to go back things the way they were, when in fact literally everything had changed. A world right. war will change everything. Right. And also, and I know this from from my my great uncle's experience. Um. Coming back from the war and seeing how people treated a black man mm -hmm. was also life changing and different. And it started to really encapsulate what it means to be treated in America and why. And I'm saying those things because what it had what had to happen is people had to realize they were no longer under this anymore. But on the other hand, greed, shame, and guilt was always under it. It was always it. And, and, it, really, mm -hmm. and it really was very, a very similar thing, right? Where mm -hmm. everybody possible was needed to fight this war. Yeah. So a lot of black people mm -hmm. and Latina people, Latino people went to war and fought so hard. Mm-hmm got little recognition, and then mm -hmm. came back, not entirely in one piece. Right. And it was, everything was expected to go back to the way that it was. Right. And it was never going to, because the direction we were going into was becoming unified under God's rule. Mm -hmm. Now, when I say that, I don't mean that the dogmatic rule that we see now, because that is a man-made invention, right? Right. But as, as we've progressed through history, there's several different things that happen that makes what I'm about to talk about possible. And that is one of them. The second thing is, I, um, I told you before, was um, Generation X. And I'm going to use that as a loose term for a period of time, not strictly this state to this state. But what, what I'm talking about is the generation that was between the purely analog and the purely digital. Right. Well, right? It's, it's a unique position to be in to grow up purely analog and then all of a sudden one day there's the internet. Yes. After a lot of us, most of us were grown. Mm -hmm. Right. But the other, yes, I had children. For real. Um, but the other thing is that 
we were also the generation who were latchkey kids. We took care of ourselves while our parents was doing the whole um, read is good thing. <laughs> well, and we were the last of the feral generations, right? Right. We had the feral generations. What we did was we found company in one another and we learned rules to organize ourselves and police ourselves. And what comes out is essential, um, these four things, empathy, truth, joy, kindness, yeah. and anti-greed. Those things will always be present when there are groups of people to some degree. Um, and we learned how to monitor ourselves along with people who did not always look like us, but had the same interests, right? Right. I was a black female in Cleveland, Ohio, and I read all the comic books. I told you one of my early, I wouldn't say mentors, but only one of my early guides was right, um, Mr. Bendis, right? Yes, Bendis. Brian Michael Bendis. Because he, 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 he has earned the Mr. <laughs> yes, he has. He absolutely has. Because he was at the comic book shop that I went to when I changed buses for school. Mm -hmm. And I would talk with him about comics and the theory behind it and story because he's really big on writing. I wanted to be a comic book artist. And he was the one who was like, be a writer. There's always going to be artists. The writers are what's going to make or break you down mm -hmm. the road. And I'd be damned if he wasn't right. His life is proof that that's right. 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 Um, so have you read... If not, I highly recommend The Amazing Adventures of Cavalier and Clay. No, I haven't. I've seen it. It's on my to-be-read to list. So it is a fictionalized account of Will Eisner's oh. uh, life and comic book history. And it won a Pulitzer, I want to say, in 2000. Mm -hmm. It is a beautifully structured book, and it's a beautifully written book. Oh, um, one of, And it's about these two cousins who get in on the bottom floor of basically of what was kickstarted to be the comic book industry. Mm -hmm. um, one of the characters is gay. Mm -hmm. um, they're both Jewish. And mm -hmm. what happened during World War II, World War II affected them both differently, but very profoundly. And, um, and it also talks a lot about one of the first and the most influential female comic book artist. Oh, who's that, that hardly ever gets mentioned today. Who? Um, I can't think of her name right off. Her name is Rosa in the book. Um, mm -hmm. But if you look at Stan Lee's drawings of that time, mm -hmm. she's there. Yes. She ran that. And I want to say they were, they had a floor in the Empire State Building. Um, and she ran that joint and she did it all. She right. wrote, she drew, she colorized, she managed the books. She did, I mean, I need to find an episode of um, an old Geek and Sundry show um, from back in the day. It was called The Wednesday Club and it was nothing but, it was just a talk show about comics, comic book history, the influence they had and they, it was a really great show. Um, and then Geek and Sundry went away, so the show went away. Right. But, yeah, so highly recommend uh, Amazing Adventure of Cavalier and Clay. It is such an excellent read. And it's so eye-opening because a lot of people forget why we have so many superhero comics today. Yes. And people forgot about the comic book code. Right. And why do we have so many comic books today? We have so many superhero comic books today because of the comics book code. So going back in, in comic books history, we had comics for everything. We had romance comics. We had uh, grimdark comics. We had sports comics. We had historical comics. We had... Um, 
we had as many comic book lines as we have book genres today. So it was like manga. It was it was everything. Right. Absolutely everything. And and it was not geared toward kids. Right. Kids were not the audience for comic books. Um and then the comic books code came along, which is basically the same it, it's the same sort of gaggle of folks who try to put the kibosh on certain content and movies and TV and books and it's those kind of cats, right? Right. Um, who sort of have a sort of say it was true, like get off on having that kind of control. Right. Control power. And it was and even though comics weren't initially geared towards children as the audience, that's who was who was buying comics. And a lot of the content was not air quote appropriate for children. Yes. So but that's who the biggest purchase purchasing market was. Mm-hmm. So Basically, the comic book code whittled down comics all the way down to the point where only superhero comics were being published. And that went on, I want to say, well into the 80s. It did. Which was another um, thing. Mm-hmm. I want to say to about 83 or so. Um, Dark Knight Returns. I think that kind of marks it for me. Here's what happened. And it's a great story and it's why Stanley was such a badass right so back in the 80s if you re- uh, i'm not sure where you were in that point but i was in elementary school um, the and 80s? i was in elementary school in southern california oh and the ghetto mm-hmm. i was raised in the inland empire for those keeping score at home <laughs> that's where my uh, family is in in california riverside so- and um orange so I grew up in San Bernardino. Yeah. Right on the border of Colton and Rialto. Mm. So I went to Colton High School. Um, before that, I was in the uh, Rialto School District. Mm-hmm. There were projects down the road. Yeah. And not quite projects across the street. Right. Uh, and I was a little girl from Seattle. <laughs> from or a Seattle suburb. Right. So... It was definitely a change of pace. Um, <laughs> it was a bit of culture but shock. Big, but the big thing that happened in Southern California in the 80s was the Say No to Drugs campaign. Mm-hmm. And it infiltrated our schools. It became part of the educational curriculum. Right? And it was such a big thing that some marketing or publicity guru had the kind of brilliant idea to get Stan Lee to write a Spider-Man comic hmm. of that was propaganda for the Say No to Drugs campaign. Right. Here's what happened. The, <laughs> now, mind you, the, it was the government who asked Stan Lee to do this. Hmm. The federal freaking government asked Stan Lee to do this. Right. So he did it. He thought it was a great idea. He wrote a Spider-Man comic about him taking down like drug dealers and telling kids to say no to drugs and stay in school. Well, because there were rep- representations of drugs and drug use, the comic book co people tried to ban it okay. before it got published. Mm-hmm. But the federal government specifically commissioned this comic from our friend, Mr. Stan Lee. Right. And yet another part of the government was telling them, no, you can't do that because of the drug use and the representations of drugs in comics. Kids are buying this. Yeah, that's kind of the point. <laughs> <laughs> so, and it went on and on and on about whether he could publish it or not. And uh, nobody could agree because government. government. <laughs> yeah. Finally, Stan Lee said, screw it. I like the idea. It's a great comic. It's a great message. I'm going to publish it. And he did. Right. And suddenly the comic book code, poof. Yep. 
all of a sudden, once that seal was broken, everybody went, well, screw this nonsense. <laughs> and it, that's... Took, it took their power away. Right, exactly. That's that's kind of the point that I'm coming here that we're going to get to. It was a bunch of little things that took power away from greedy, shameful, or folks who want to inflict shame and inflict guilt on people for the sake of power and power alone. To be able defanging, to... Defanging bullies is so important. Yes, it absolutely is. Now, I'm going to go back to Generation X. I'm going to need a lot of runway to do this. Okay, Donna? Okay. Do you want me to read the quote that we were looking for first? Yes. Okay. So I was right. It was Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Mm -hmm. In the beginning, the universe was created. This has made a lot of people angry and has been widely regarded as a bad move. <laughs> Kind of sums Ain't it up, lying, right? <laughs> Ain't lying. Oh my God, love I miss him. I miss him. Oh, R.I.P. Douglas Adams was yes. the bomb. He's the he was so, one of the best satirists, and he had such a heart on him. Had such a big heart on him, and such oh. a wild imagination. Mm -hmm. All right, I just, back to Generation yeah. X. Yes, because we're doing. So, we're we're here. We're about to do a prophecy, sweetheart. <laughs> <laughs> about gen x well this is gonna get chaotic so is the runway on fire then oh yes it is give me a minute oh um, it's on fire and people are roasting marshmallows because we're gen much. x <laughs> yes this is this is what it is what happened was we we found our groups that's how we got on this tangent about business and comics and everything mm. because i found my group with comic books and role-playing games. Mm -hmm. And I was usually the only female in the room and most certainly the only black woman and black girl in the room. But... Uh, speaking as a and d -er from that era, same. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so their adjustments had to be made. I had to stand my ground and I had to... I had to work to sit there and get a spot in that, but eventually that happened. And as that's happened, um, and the internet started to come, we started to go into groups on the internet to the point mm -hmm. now where most of our interaction is on the internet. And if you notice, now what we're doing is calling out those things when we see it and changing those things when we see it. Is it still imperfect? Yes. It's not about perfection. It's about the struggle. All right. Do you think part of that was because it was, a, at the time at least, it was a safe place from our parents' generations? Yes, absolutely. Where we could speak and be heard? It still is. It's, that's still the reason. And I'm talking about at, at our old age. I mean, I know you're 10 years younger than me, but still. <laughs> it, it's, it's a way to get away from the folks who just kind of don't get us and find places where we could be understood. It's... The similarities to those communities, remember like AOL and GeoCities and all that mm -hmm. stuff? Mm -hmm. it, it, it reminded me at the time so much of like the punk community. That's another and thing. The mosh pit, right. right? Those are all different practical applications of the same principle. That as we started to group together and get to know one another and figure things out. We started to build these communities and we have in general, in general have gone to a route of empathy, kindness, joy, truth, and anti-greed. Mm -hmm. That, that has been it. When, and we also hear this a lot so much that it's become that's is truly become legend is that once folks start trying to make money at it then that's when it's destroyed because that's when greed is introduced mm -hmm. that's when greed is introduced so generation x was really responsible we're the gatekeepers between the analog and the digital 
I, I, I would say more like a guardian or centurion, but we were the buffer between what our parents did that harmed and traumatized us <laughs> and our future generation, my children who are in their 30s, late 20s, early 30s, as they started to get their footing, seeing things differently, seeing things closer to that lens than not. And as social media and all that has come around, it has only become stronger and stronger and stronger. Well, they were socialized differently where the whole world was literally at their fingertips, mm -hmm. which is a beautiful thing. It is a beautiful thing. And it's also a heavy responsibility because when I was growing up, my, my neighborhood was insular, right? Mm -hmm. I had to go out. If they hadn't bust in Cleveland, I would have stayed on the east side of Cleveland my entire life because everything was there. Everything was in walking distance. Everything was mm -hmm. there. And the only thing I actually had to take the bus for was to go to the West Side Market and go to the stadium. And that was it. So, um, yeah, Milwaukee was very much the same way. And when busing came, I had to go to the West Side. And that's when I discovered all of this. When I went outside my world, I discovered all of this and I started um my horizon started to expand and I instilled that in my children. I also when, instilled, I also so, instilled, let me finish. Okay. I also instilled the concept of making joy the center of your life instead mm -hmm. of a man being the center of your life. And that will be hard to hear for a lot of Christians because you, a lot of their identity is placed on having a family and having children, and that is your work. Whereas that's not true. And not only that, but in the Bible, as we go on in the New Testament, Paul even said that marriage and children were a distraction, right? To, well, and, and I'm saying that to say that the Bible places importance on the family, mm -hmm. right? It absolutely does. But it also says, these are the rules if you choose to marry. These are the rules if you choose to have a child, right? Mm -hmm. You don't have to. And understand that both are seen as good in the eyes of God, as long as you're using your discernment, as long as you're doing this through the Holy Spirit, which empathy, joy, truth, kindness, and anti-greed are part of them, right? All right. So as we go on, well, the global, the globe is, oh my God, I'm having a hard time concentrating because I can't get a complete thought out. Um, these things set the stage for what is happening. And this is the point where I kind of go into my story because in my work, in my spiritual work, I am a prophet and a messenger of God. I am what's referred to as the harbinger of truth. That is to say, I come in and tell people, I give people a choice. Actually, I give very specific people a very specific choice. I come in with a person who, for reasons outside of their control, are seen as less than, and they have built their life to the point where they are on the cusp of whatever their dream is. This also sinks into me being a gin, but I'm going to sidetrack that. I'm going to sideline that. I'm sorry. But the choice is twofold, especially if they use their grief, shame, and guilt to get to where they are. They can either continue on that path, and while it will be successful, and it will be, and it will be as good as they want it to be, it will be short lived. It will once again crumble and be ash in the mouth as prophesied because that is that is what happens when you deal in greed shame and guilt or they can look through the lens of these things remove shame guilt and greed and all and go through the losses that come from that loss of reputation being ridiculed um being isolated and alone in some cases um And slowly, with consistent, deliberate effort, 
get to the place where they can break through their trauma and get to their joy because there is not one trauma that anyone has that doesn't, I'm going to use this. Let's say that this is trauma, right? Mm -hmm. This little lid right here is trauma. All this down here is a joy that is hidden and protect from this trauma. Mm -hmm. So if you have something in here, let me put some of these rock chips in there because this is your joy. This is, this is your joy. God given joy where you connect mm -hmm. to the Lord, all of that. Right. That's here. They're pretty. And here's your trauma. Right. A lot of people will put things in front of it so you so no one gets to it because of mm -hmm. trauma but if you go and you go through the effort of opening this lid oh and because i'm talking about it, it's going to be difficult right <laughs> you can get to your you can get to your joy but a lot of people don't realize that that's what's behind that what happens if i let go of this thing what happens if I let go of my trauma? I don't want to let go of my trauma because I've built an entire identity around it. Or I don't want to give get rid of these practices or these beliefs because people will think I'm not righteous or people will think I'm lazy or people will think I'm a whore or people will think I'm soft or people think they can take advantage of me. And some will and try. But we are no longer in the business of trying to avoid being hit. We are in the business now of facing those losses and removing shame, guilt, and greed and replacing it with personal responsibility, right? And once you do that, you find that your world fills with joy. And when your world fills with joy, you don't need that craving anymore. Comparison is the thief of joy. Joy is a grief and greed killer. All right. Mm -hmm. So when given that choice, what do they do? And that has been the focus of my work for over 40 years. And I will tell you that 10 to 1 ratio, they will pick their ego and it will go badly for them. But I will also tell you that once they learn that lesson, everything turns around for them. Their redemption arc. It is storied because it's true. Now, what I do is I usually spend time just being in their environment and just showing examples of how living that way works. And then if I am if I'm guided to, I sit up there and tell them specifically what the what their issue is what they um what they will benefit from what the results and the consequences are from taking each choice All right All right and i've been doing this for decades like i said now what happened is i usually what happened is in 20 in 2010 I went from dealing with individuals, helping individuals solely to institutions. And my first assignment in that was transitioning a group because they, their leader had made the ego choice <laughs> and they were going through the part where everything turned to ash in his mouth. Mm -hmm. All right. And at that point, I become the curse breaker and the grief eater. I come in and just kind of usher in what happens next. And that was 11 very hard but good years. And being, once again, the only Black woman, most times, a very liberal, very wild Black woman in a very conservative, white, affluent Presbyterian church, is something right and my job was just basically to go through my business and go through my life but mm -hmm. in doing that it instills a truth that shakes and creates chaos 
and changes what people pray for. This big black barefoot woman in your very conservative white church is wilding out. Okay. And I'm talking about wilding out. And it is very obvious that she is blessed by God. It is very obvious that she is, is she is serving God. It just looks very different. And what does that say about the things that I'm holding on to? Because first they have to sit up there and um, acknowledge that this is happening. And then through all of this, everyone takes a little thing out and they look at it and they hope it's true. And as they look at it and dissect it and look through it and apply it to themselves, they start to see where they can remove uh, shilting game. (laughs) Uh, shame and guilt right and they see that it's coming from their greed and to make that change open up that lid and access their joy right and when you access the joy you start asking for different things when you start asking for different things different entities answer it this is going to i'm going i believe as a Christian, I am in a covenant with Elohim. I am in the covenant with God, Jesus Christ, right? Jehovah, I am in the covenant with him. But he is not the only God. He is the most high God, right? There are other entities and there are other beings that are prayed to with answer prayers, mainly because we are so far flung from his glory. We are so sinful and so far flung from his glory of his glory that if he sent angels they'd wipe us out it'd be our ass because we are just not their glory itself would destroy us so you have to get folks who are more familiar and versed in these things greed uh degree shame and guilt and i worked in that church for about 10 years and the mainly because they were not to fall into the cult of personality again that they had with this first leader and i was i was here to back the lord's play with adopting the second one and mm-hmm. that transition eventually i was done with that and went about my merry way started building a building a what i feel like is maybe the best organization that embodies this as best as humanly possible right now and that's 20 books to 50k my job as as i was assigned to it was just to enjoy it cuz i didn't know how to enjoy shit but but enjoying it and also helping people see the joy in their creativity and pulling away shame and guilt from that. I think that was the reason why that was one of the reasons why I was never motivated to do stuff like writing the market. Cause can I write the market? Absolutely. I can. Absolutely. I can. And there are tools to make it easier day by day by day. But what people will tell you, what you've seen, what Karen has told you, what Tom has told you, is that I have no interest in it. I absolutely have no interest in writing the things that make me money. I have an interest in writing the things that bring me joy. And what brings me joy is writing about the lens. <laughs> I'll go tell you. I, I, I'm obsessed with it. And I'm obsessed with it because it works. It makes people happy. It brings people into their joy, right? And so did that for from 2016 to 2020. What? 2016 to 2020. Did I say that right? Is that only four years? That's only four years. Jesus. Oh, okay. Well, what was the last time I went to a 20 books? When was... Uh, I do not know. Well, it would have been probably before 2020 because that was pandemic. Well, no, I went to the one after that. What was, when was Andor out? Andor season one, um, episode 10. 
I can tell you that. Um, season that one was episode. Last, was that last year or 2022? I, I'm about to find out. Such uh, a good tw- show, by the way. Such a good show. Epi- um, November 9th, 2022. That is the last time I was there. So it's, it was eight years. It, I can't re- believe how much the days run together mm-hmm. like since the pandemic. Like I yes. have no sense of time or space anymore. Right. We're going to talk about that too. And I'm sure mm-hmm. there's a name for that. It's just when you're already near a spicy, mm-hmm. that's a little too much heat. <laughs> right. I like to know. I like to be anchored in time and space. <laughs> right. But that's another thing. That was what happened afterwards. I had nothing to do with the pandemic, by the way. This is, at this point, this is something that I noticed. But what the pandemic did was disrupted everything. It did. It disrupted how we live our lives. It disrupted and decentralized working at a place. It made remote work a viable option, allowing people freedom of movement and freedom for corporations. Mm -hmm. It also um, forced us to really look at what was essential and what wasn't. It showed, it showed clearly who had empathy, kindness, joy, and who was willing to face the truth. And it showed greed. Okay. Mm -hmm. 2016 to 2020 was the years Trump was in office, right? Mm-hmm. And when he went into office, we were still really big on the greed is good thing. He's a businessman. Yeah, he's done some bad things, but he's going to get us there. And I don't want this to make I don't want to make this political, but I do have to because those four years plus the pandemic kind of put the spotlight on mm-hmm. shame, guilt, and greed. And um, by the time the Biden administration was over, we were starting to see Trump and the MAGA people for what they were, right? For what they were and the harm that they had caused, including taking away body autonomy, all of that, right? Mm -hmm. And then all the wars and the conflicts they kind of, it has, it has made us more aware and also much like your story with the comic book code, because COVID disrupted everything, it gave us an opportunity to try and do new things, right? It Mm -hmm. it, it gave us the opportunity to, to break out of those things and build lives that were outside those power structures based on greed, sh- uh, greed, guilt, and shame. Oh my God. So, and, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and this, the, like the dissolution on the comic book code, which gave rise to some glorious peaks of work. Mm-hmm. It was a watershed moment within the industry. Um, it gave, it it gave us, it opened the door to Sandman. Yes. And Dark Knight Returns, which I still, I, it was my first, that was my first like Hallmark iconic comic, Kingdom Come, um, shit, uh, The Mask. Oh, when was, um, when was Watchmen published? Was that before or after the, I want to say that was probably after the comic book code. Oh, um, after the comic book code. Um, because that really disrupted everything. Alan Moore just turned everything about superheroes on its head with Watchmen. Mm-hmm. Um, def- again, definitely not for kids, right? Definitely. Yeah. And not for kids at all. At all at all. It's like The Boys, which is another right. one. Which I enjoy immensely. But it's you have to have a stomach for it. Eighty six um, and eighty seven. That's what I thought. I thought it was about runabout there. Yeah, um, it is. It gave us it opened us to Saga Swamp Thing, mm-hmm. which gave us John Constantine. Yes. Which, which I bought that thing off of a newsstand at the corner store in my neighborhood. Mm-hmm. At a very young age, and I still have it. 
I may or may not have sent it off to the my ratty, <laughs> my completely ratty copy um, that I've had all these years off to be graded. The CGT to be rated, and it's terrible, but I've I've got it in case for posterity, you know. Yes. Because the pristine ones are going to go away. Watch it. All right. So, um, we are at a platform. We're at a point. Everything set the stage to sit up there and to shift to empathy, joy, kindness, truth, and anti greed. Now, for me, I'm watching this and watching as the church community kind of splits, right? Mm hmm. And watching the rise of Christian nationalism, um, basically because in Donald Trump, in MAGA, I should say, because I really do want to take this, take this away from any one person, but in the MAGA, and it's kind of sad to kind of talk about this, but... And then I lost my thought. Okay, then I'm going on to the next one. And no, I really need to talk. I really need okay. to think this through and talk it through because that's okay. I was going to say something, and the Lord was like, "No, we're not going to say that." And we're the Lord took this. it away. Right? The Lord giveth, and the Lord taketh away. Okay, I'll say it like this. I think this is the reason why, but I was trying not to say it like this, but. MAGA and Donald Trump found their identity. They found the they found the power that they had thought they lost through diversity, right? Mm -hmm. The Christian Church has always been about power, and even more so during the Reagan era, they really mm -hmm. tried to grab at power it is the, uh, the the great harlot um babylon the great um having relations with the kings of the world right because mm -hmm. for power trying to get power and greed and the christian nationals really really clung on to donald trump because it gave them it validated their greed, sh greed shame and guilt it validated them even though he was the very thing they said they was he was against but because he um was racist because he was misogynistic because he was greedy and believed in corporate power at, on winning at all costs because he had all of those things it appealed to them and they clung to it and they jumped on his dick so hard. So hard that they thought that pearl necklace was really pearl necklace. And when they came around and COVID came and all these things started to happen and they started to see the consequence of their actions, they realized it was just cum stains on their blue dress. And I swear to God, I was trying to make this clean, but the Lord said, no, say it like this. And so... Well, it's honest, right? <laughs> it's honest. But that's the thing. They are seeing that this was a sham and this was, they're getting consequences even worse now because they're holding on to it and people are fighting back and they're getting consequences and there's no one they can go to because they are at the far end of, the far end of greed. They're fully encompassed and engulfed in their greed. And so, and I'm saying all of this to say, when January 5th, January 6th, sorry, happened. And I believe you and I were on a call that day when it was going down. It, we were on a call on that day when it was going down. That's 2021. When that happened, doing the work that I did, and knowing that it was a choice between, it was a classic choice between having a peaceful transfer of power, admitting the truth that you lost the election, having that peaceful transfer of power and going on and just talking to his people. Had he done that? MAGA would have been bulletproof. 
Had he done that, MAGA would have been the Republican Party. All right? It just, it just makes you sure that we're very clear. Because mm-hmm. he had so much prestige and he had so many people backing him. And a lot of the moderates were backing him because they knew that not backing him meant the death of their political career, mm-hmm. right? Shame and guilt, right? A lot of people backed him because he was the guy and he was. And had he just did the peaceful exchange of power, he would have cemented that in his legacy, right? But the problem was he couldn't. He absolutely couldn't get past his greed, right? And the shame of losing, right? Or the ego, right? Because what we're talking about is... What we're talking about is such a level of ego that he it was pure id. Right. And when he did that and called for the attack on the Capitol, what that did was that made him shoot up with the MACA people for a while, and then the consequences came, and it all started to fall apart. And as COVID came through and all of that, it just it started to show how harmful and how much damage that these three things, shame, guilt, and greed, are to humans. And so, also, when I saw that on such a big scale, um, the call came, the calling came to be watchful to be watchful, to watch what happens. Because I also know that when that happens, somebody of the equal level makes the same decision. What makes a different decision, makes a decision to go through, look at through the lens and be anti-greed, anti-shame, anti-guilt, right? Um, it took years for that to happen. And in the meantime, once I saw that, in the meantime, the calling started to become clear and I was able, through a lot of hard work and a lot of loss, to articulate this path, right? I had to make sure that what I was seeing was correct. What I see wasn't just going off and doing some Jim Jones bullshit, but it's mm-hmm. honestly making sure that it was considering the scriptures and the Lord's thoughts on this. And I went back through the study of the Bible and it is just simply an anti, it is an anti greed manifesto, right? And that's what it is at its basic core. And so with all of that in hand, when July 9th came around this year, and Joe Biden, who was, who has wanted to be president for at least 35 years, has been running hard to be president for years and years and years and years and years, became vice president working on the Barack Obama, which there have been men who admitted to me in private that. They couldn't do that. They honestly couldn't do that, right? They couldn't just defer to a black man. And I found that I found that noteworthy because I heard that a lot. I'm like, they wouldn't, they wouldn't say it like out loud, but I have a lot of conversations like the one we're having with a lot of people. And that's one thing that came out a lot. It's like they can't Is believe it a pride that you, thing? It's a pride thing. It's a race thing. It's a white man thing. Mm. So these are white men telling me this. I can't relate. But if they're telling me this, if they're telling me this and they're coming from a very vulnerable place, I accept it as true, right? And so that was also something I took part in. I mean, I uh, took note of. But he was, he, he was vice president and then he made it to president, Right. And 
he had a it, chance and an opportunity. Let me finish this because mm -hmm. I really need to get this out. Um, no, nope. he he had an opportunity. He had the choice. He could have gone and pushed and done this election. He may have won. He may not have. Right. He could have kept fighting because this is what he has wanted forever. He still had a lot of good work to do and he was making progress. Right. But he looked over here, removed shame, removed guilt, removed greed and stepped aside for his vice president. Who then brought someone else who it seems like they are really healing the country. There is joy back. There's more patriot, patriotism coming back. And I can literally see that. And not only that, but in Tim Walls as the VP pick, there has been a lot of grieving behind. I heard, what I heard was that Tim Walls was the dad that Rush Limbaugh and the MAGA people stole from them. Right. Right. And so and being able to say that and let that grief and hurt out can in some ways make it so MAGA folks can turn just a little bit towards the lens, towards empathy, truth, um, empathy, truth, joy, kindness and anti-greed there. Right. Just a little bit as we're progressing forward and forward, right? But for me, I mean, it's all that to me, but to me, it was one other thing. It was, it was time. It was what I needed to see to be able to start my ministry. My ministry started when I saw that the most powerful man in the world had chosen the lens. And once that happened, I had to start talking about it because that was the start of Armageddon. We are literally getting to the point, we're literally going to the point where we are changing and dismantling the structures that greed created. And for me, that includes well, not for me, that includes, that is not true. What that means is as Christians, we will have to accept a few things. Number one, our message is now about how we accept this truth into our life and how we make the transitions in our own personal life as families and as a church, because we're taking away we're getting away from you're disrespecting the Lord with the Lord's Supper and all that and how dare that what man fight with women we're getting away from that we are getting away from that right and we're going away from Christianity is the only path to salvation. All men have received salvation through removing shame, guilt, and greed. And actively pursuing empathy, truth, joy, and kindness. And this is the, that is the natural state of man. That is who we are to our core. And we are only going to get closer and closer to that. We, that does not require, it doesn't require worshiping the Judeo-Christian God to do. But as Judeo-Christians, we are supposed to be example as we accept this truth, as we struggle with it, as we experience loss, and as we rebuild. Because once again, it's not about the loss. The loss hurts. It's about the recovery of it. It is about how we rebuild. It's about what comes next. 
And this is going to be very hard for Christians to hear because the Christian life is built on those things. It's going to be hard to hear because that kills the patriarchy. Now, does submission and subjection for women still work under this? Yes. I am a very submissive wife, but I am not submissive and subjected to every swinging dick I see. Mm -hmm. Right? And even with my husband, it is, we are partners, right? And I, and I back his play, right? Do but, men need a new societal, societal role to latch on to? No, no. What they need to do is stop being greedy. Stop trying to, what they need to do is develop a personality, develop empathy, joy, truth, and kindness. Because for the longest time, because everything was controlled by them and women did not have their own autonomy, they did, all they had to do was have a home and make some money. That's all they needed to have a wife. And the wife was stuck because she couldn't have anything of her own. With the decentralizing of men in women's lives, Men must have a personality. They must be kind. They must be able, willing to compromise, which is the reason why we go back to the Christian nationalists. We're going back to the folks in religion who are trying to get rid of abortion, get rid of IVF, um, trying to take away jobs, trying to um, make it so that women do not have the rights that they have anymore. So they can be subservient again. That is not the direction we are going in. That's not the direction we are going in. Right? If we are, if, if you're in covenant with Christ, as I am, there are rules you need to follow, but you must realize that the Bible and everything is talking to you, not to them. They also have the same they say they have the same promise, the same opportunity, and the same blessings coming to them, but their story looks different, mm -hmm. right? Our job is to take this on because we are going to come with God. We take this on. We take the losses of it. And for far too long, Christians have believed that because they're Christians and there are people set aside, that means that nothing will harm them. That is not the truth. Mm -hmm. It's literally walking to our deaths. The death of the person that we were under sh shame, guilt, and greed. And so that's what that's what I am doing now. That is my ministry now. That's what I'm talking about now. That's the reason why we're doing this. And that's why I'm doing CK's beliefs are irrelevant because we are, I'm not the only one. I'm, I'm rare, but I'm not unique. There are many, many my, like me who have been in service to their God or service in or have looked through the lens for that long and have starting to expose it to their people explicitly. Not, not exactly the way I'm saying it, because the way I'm saying it is, is the way I can express it. And it also links in with my background and how the Lord has made me and he has made me a creative. So this is how I am talking about this to within this the um realm of my power and to those who listen to me because well a small flock it's going to be a small flock not everyone is going to accept it and there will be some people probably opposed to this because it breaks down everything they have built so much to they they it burns down everything that they've taken so long and put so much effort in to build. Well, I think you pointed out is it's terrifying to lose everything. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. it is really the only way to grow. Yes. Is to shed your armor, shed your weapons, shed your ego, shed um, 
expectations, shed, oh, everything. Illusions. Illusions are the toughest thing to shed. Yes. But it is essential, and it's interesting that shedding those illusions is a watershed moment in the feminine heroic journey. Mm-hmm. Right? Why don't, you, why don't you outlay that? Because this is becoming a podcast now. <laughs> so there's an old story. I want to say it's Hindu called The Descent of Anana. Mm-hmm. And okay, well, we're talking about Story the hero, here. yes, the, 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 the outline of the feminine hero's journey. Let's talk about so, Wonder Woman. Yeah, it's it's actually that's exactly what it is. Is the first Wonder Woman movie um, illustrated it perfectly? Mm-hmm. Um, and I say that because Wonder Woman was not just a woman who just exchanged places with a man had a, a male journey. Mm-hmm. Another really excellent uh, example of it is uh, Thor Love and Thunder. Yes. Yeah. Because occasionally a male hero will will give up the male journey and take on the feminine. Right. Um, can, you exact- outline, can you outline what yeah. the, the key points in, key points in yeah. that are? Actually, yes. Uh, just give me a second here. Just to pull up my bullet point list, because you know I write a lot of feminine heroic journeys. Yes. Um, but it is a path to ascension and evolution. Right. Um, da, 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 da. I wish I had my book with me, but okay. Yeah, it's kind of interesting because in the first Thor movie, Thor is very much on the male heroic journey. Yes, he is. <laughs> and by fourth movie, he is very much on the feminine heroic journey against mm-hmm. a feminine antagonist. Right. Da, 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 da. Okay. Where are my notes? Where are my notes? While you're uh, doing that, let me see if I can talk about the hero's journey just for just for comparison. The um, hero's journey is classic, and it is in three acts: departure, initiation, and return. Mm-hmm. Departure is the call to adventure, the refusal to call, supernatural aid, the crossing of the first threshold, right? Um, and then the belly of the whale, getting in deep trouble. Initiation is the road to trials, the meeting with the goddess, woman as the temptress, atonement for the father. Hold on, let me not do that. Um, <laughs> that was weird. Okay, I'm going to clip this and I'm going to start over. Let's go over the hero's journey. And I'm not going to do Campbell. I'm going to do Vogler because that's the one I know. Um Ordinary world, call to adventure, refusal of the call, meeting with the mentor, crossing the first threshold. That's departure. And then initiation is test allies and enemies, approach to the innermost cave, the ordeal and the reward, right? The road back and the resurrection and then coming back um, with the election, coming back with the answer. If I had to say, I went, I went through the hero's journey um, on January 6th, if I'm going to be honest, I went through that. And then the heroine's journey. Okay. There we go. Okay. Mm-hmm. So, so there are, just like with the hero's journey, there are nine, there are nine parts and three acts. Right. So the first part is Illusion of a per- perfect world, right. right? So, a really good example of this, uh, and a brilliant example of this, is the marvelous Mrs. Maisel. 
Mm-hmm. That entire first episode of that first season is a complete portrait of her perfect feminine life. Yes. She's protected. She's cherished. She has everything she could ever want. The perfect marriage. The perfect children. Her perfect apartment. Her parents are right upstairs. It's, it's, she's just got this. I mean, she doesn't see the signs, right? And at the end of that first episode, her husband fails at something that he desperately wants to do, and it's somehow her fault. Right. And he knows damn well it's not, right? Um, But he doesn't want, but he doesn't want to face it. But he's projecting, right? right? And then the the affair comes out, and he's leaving her with her suitcase, you know? Um. That, that illusion breaks, right? Right. What's the next one? That's the next part, the betrayal. Right. It's disillusionment. Mm-hmm. So you go from illusion of a perfect world with all the coping strategies of getting on day-to-day life. Um, there's naivete. There's a belief you are one of the boys. There's everything will work out as long as you can please everyone. Right. Then the betrayal. All those coping strategies fall apart. Mm-hmm. Uh, and what's the third part? The third part is the awakening and preparing for the journey. Okay, and what is that first section called? Okay, so th- that's that's the first act. So what is that first act called, or is it named? I something? don't I don't have it written down. I mean, it's um, it's the it's the preparing for the journey section, right? I... You haven't crossed the line into the journey yet. Mm-hmm. So the awakening is uh, you're processing the grief, you're processing the trauma, um, but the heroine decides to do something about it, right? So, you know, in Wonder Woman, she goes to battle against intruders that come because of Steve Rogers, right? Right. And she decides she needs to go out into the world and face the great antagonist, right? Right. right. So, so what uh, section is that again? So this is preparing for the journey. Okay. Then we begin our descent. We're passing the gates of judgment. Okay. Uh, the heroine experiences fear, abandonment, guilt, and or shame. There you go. Mm-hmm. Associated with giving up their old way of living. What is that called again? That is called the descent. Okay. Uh, passing the gates of judgment. Mm-hmm. Uh, they may feel guilty about sexual feelings or expression, or they may have fears or shame with expressing themselves, honoring intuition, and letting go of relationships that are important. Right. Mm-hmm. Very feminine experience, right? Yes, it is. What's the next one? Uh... Eye of the Storm. Okay. The heroine experiences a small taste of success, which brings about a false sense of security. Aye. Nice, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, The heroine may experience momentary but not sustained success because those around the heroine do not want to be led by a woman. Yes. Or a minority. Mm Mm-hmm. For very long because others begin to undermine them or because mm-hmm. the crisis passes and the heroine is left trying to fill multiple roles that are impossible for a single person to fulfill mm-hmm. doesn't that just sound like being a woman <laughs> well it goes back <laughs> to what we were talking about how women took over a lot of the manual jobs during the war and then the soldiers came back and they expected life to resume as it was Mm-hmm. And soldiers very reasonably and understandably wanted to leave the horrors of that terrible war behind and get back to normal idyllic life by comparison, right? Right. But there's all these women there, and the women are expected to be treating differently. I mean, it's, you know, because they've been doing the work. It's just, yeah. And also, it's it's become a part of common conversation now um, as we're understanding emotional fluency that uh, the concept of unpaid labor 
and emotional labor. And women carrying the bulk of that on top of being breadwinners, on top of this, this, and this, and this, and this, right? Okay, what's the, okay, so the last two sections was what? So that was the eye of the storm. Okay. Now we're in the death, so now we're in the death stage, all is lost. Yes. This is about uh, spiritual. The heroine realizes that their original coping strategies are not effective and that their newfound skills tools cannot sustain them. Mm -hmm. Maintaining a state of respect constant of uh, maintaining a state of uh, respect requires constant fighting survival mode right yeah and as things get worse the heroine feels there is no hope despite their efforts they they fall and accept defeat yes that's the okay. end of act two yes yeah, so now we're into the final act uh, we get into support. The heroine meets someone who offers support. The heroine embraces the feminine aspect of support and accepts that they are not completely self-sufficient. Mm -hmm. We were just talking about this, right? The heroine embraces their need for support as a positive thing. Right. And that's what we were talking about this when we tried to do this the other day. Mm. And we talked for an hour and 45 minutes and there was no audio. <laughs> but I think Everything this is happens a better... for a reason, right? Oh my yes. gosh. Yes, and the reason was that so I could get it out for the first time. And mm -hmm. also so we could talk about this because I'm loving how you're equating this to the feminine journey. And I can also relate to this because I had the hardest time in my spiritual work asking for help because I thought I needed to keep it secret. I thought my greatest power was the fact that it was secret and the fact that no one would understand me if, um, or think I, they would think I was crazy if and they would not support me if I told them this truth. And I found that I was really underestimating y'all and for that I'm sorry. And I wasn't trusting y'all and for that I'm sorry. And now that y'all are here, I am so glad you're here. Well, that is a understandable response to trauma, mm -hmm. lifelong trauma, perhaps yeah. even generational trauma. Mm -hmm. True that. So what's the next part? The next part is rebirth, the moment of truth. The heroine finds their strength and resolve with the help of support. They awaken and see the world and their role with, within it differently. Mm -hmm. The heroine understands that brains, heart, and courage will be required, and they face their own fear with conviction. It resonates for a reason, right? Yes. So, you know... Compassion is kindness, by the way. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, and... In Wonder Woman, I mean, she loses everything, right? Mm -hmm. She thinks the sword is the god killer. Yes. She faces... Um, Lupin. Uh, I know, right? I always think of him as Lupin. He's such well, a good actor. Yes, but also he has and six so pack lovely. abs. I was like, where you get them abs from? Oh, I'm pretty you sure didn't those get those CGI because he is a skinny-ass white boy. Right? Um, like in the best, po I mean that in the best possible way, because no. I have a thing for skinny ass, like British guys, right? Mm -hmm. um, they're just so lovely. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, so and God of War, right? She faces the God of War, thinking the sword is going to be the thing that you know gets the job done as the God Slayer, and it's not the sword. And meanwhile, her crew is out there sacrificing themselves to give her the chance to win. Uh, first of all, she even mistakes the God of War for someone else completely because of illusions. And then when it's when uh, they're revealed to be somebody she thought was a friend, someone she could trust, someone on their side, not on the Nazi side, 
then, I mean, that just disabuses her of all those illusions, right? I mean, she spends the movie having all of her illusions disabused, right? Yes. Uh, including the one that, you know, if she puts on glasses, nobody's going to notice she's a gorgeous woman. <laughs> <laughs> I love you, Etta. <laughs> Edda was the best. Um, but meanwhile, Steve Rogers is sacrificing himself. Her crew is, are sacrificing themselves all so that she has her moment and they're dying and it's not working and she's failing. Right. So she's got to shed herself of all illusion. And she realizes she is the God Slayer. Not the sword. The sword and the armor that she took at the beginning of the movie got nothing to do with it. It's just cool sword and armor, right? Right. And let's be honest, cool enough that she was able to shield punch an entire building. But, <laughs> love that movie so much. I know, so do I. That is not helping. Okay, let me take this off. Yeah, I know, right? Um, but, she doesn't ascend. She doesn't realize her true power until she gives up everything. The sword, the armor, the illusions, the ego. She, only then does she realize her true power. Yeah. Um, so that's her rebirth. Because she, because she discovers her love and compassion for the world. And for herself. At her true self. Uh, and then finally we return to a world seen through new eyes. The heroine sees the world for what it is. Their experience will change others, but receiving recognition for being a change maker is not the heroine's priority. Exactly. Oh my God, this is starting to sound like my story. <laughs> because I well, remember maybe talking to... Yeah. I should send this to you and you can start filling in the blanks and building your journey. I think I will be. I think not only will I be building my journey, but I think using this as a framework will also help kind of sculpt what I'm doing with TK's beliefs are irrelevant. Also, I think this is a really great, it, it, it can be nothing but a good thing if more men undertook the feminine heroic journey. Yeah. It feels like a thing that is missing. I think it's growing and it's changing slowly. Mm -hmm. but we must evolve mm -hmm. and all these watershed moments that we've experienced one after the other right yeah. for the past several years it's just trauma after trauma after trauma after trauma all of humanity being traumatized one way or another yeah. 16 ways to sunday mm-hmm it's the pain of reversal we are forced to evolve. And those who don't evolve are going to be left behind. Mm -hmm. They are. It, because we are only ever going to get closer and closer to looking through the lens. We're not going back. And I, and I don't want this to sound political once again, but we're not. We're not going back to those things. We can't. You know I mean? Well, we're not. That's the thing. It isn't a can't. It isn't a, if we're slipping, if this will happen. No, we are being moved. And that's the difference. This is something that no one on earth can stop. And no one in heavens is going to. Feel me? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And that's a bold statement, and that's a lot. And, oh, it's, it's such good news, and it's such a big task. But thankfully, all we have to worry about is purposefully, deliberately living life through the lens. Because the goal, as we make this shift, is get to the point where folks like me, to the point where folks like me lose their job. 
The reason mm -hmm. why I'm here and the reason why I do this work is because once again, we're too sinful for angels to come in. Mm -hmm. Once we've gotten to a certain point, the angels will come in. We'll get back into the age of miracles. And then there'll be some time there too, because this to get here took generations. It took decades and decades and decades. It's going to take another, it's going to take another set of generations and decades and decades for that. It may go faster now that things were in place, the structures that held these, the held racism, that held, that held misogyny and corporate greed in place, those things are breaking. And we're only moving faster and barreling in the other direction. It's like somebody pulled this in a slingshot and went pew, right? We're only ever going to do that. We're ever go. We're ever only going to go in that direction. There's a lot of things that will die in the in the process, but yeah, that's where we are right now, and I think that's where we should end this right now because I have run out of things to say on the topic. <laughs> okay, um, I'm going to stop recording. Okay.